Harpreet Suri and I welcome you all to this very special live interview with Nandana Dev Sen. I also want to welcome the moms community we have with us today. It's the very popular Siddhi from Mom Imperfecto. Upasna, the end all be all of mom communities from Gurgaon Mom. And Sukirti or from Sipping Thoughts who talks about real women with real conversations and real thoughts. And our guest for today is Nandana Dev Sen, who's a writer, a child activist, an award-winning actor, and just like me, she's a mom too. Nandana has come up with this very special book called The Acrobat, a collection of poems written by her mother, a celebrated poet, Nabanita Dev Sen. So I welcome you and let's get started. I really want to know, I was going through the book, it's very emotional. I wanted to know that how was this whole experience for you for translating your own mother's poetry and you know because switching languages is a tough one so how did these emotions come by yeah you know switching languages of course as indians we are switching languages all the time but it's a it's switching languages in poetry as you rightly point out is a very uh, it's a complicated thing but honestly the the, the experience of it was um, truth be told very painful because my mother and I were supposed to do this book together. We signed the contract for this one, which was the international edition, uh, just two weeks before she died. And she was really excited about it. This was the first time she had over 100 books to her credit. Um, but this is the first time a book of hers was going to be published for an international audience. So she was really looking forward to it. And I was um, very excited to work on this with her. So. It, it became the only project that I was able to work on during lockdown because she died just a few weeks before the whole planet got hit by the pandemic. Um, and I loved do I, I loved working on the translations because with every poem, her voice came back to me almost. A lot like of emotions, she, I'm sure. You know, she's she racing back to you. Yeah, and she was. It felt like she was just standing. She was right next to me, and I, 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 it was I could hear her voice literally, not sort of figuratively. So it was very, it was a way of continuing the conversation with her, which was wonderful. But uh, it was also really, uh, really? disorienting and heartbreaking because she felt so close, and yet, of course, she was so far away. And I had to remind myself every day that she was gone. So uh, it was uh, both wonderful and, and at the same time quite painful all right so the book has a very interesting name it says the acrobat would you like to share the story you know how did this name came about because trust me when i was also looking at it why would she name it that so i really want to know the story well you know there's a poem in the book maybe i'll read that out that's hmm. the um it's the first uh it's the title poem and and the I think it will make sense when I read it. She thought she knew acrobatics rather well, that she could juggle time with both hands, play with the now right next to the then. She would make both dance, she thought, fist to fist, and she would glide so smooth along the tight rope. She thought she could do absolutely anything at all. Only once in your life will the rope shiver. So this poem is called Acrobat. She wrote it in, in Bangla in this book, Tumi Monastir Koro. And um, the story behind it is that I decided to uh, translate that book for her 75th birthday as a, as a surprise birthday present. So that's this book called Make Up Your Mind. And because I it was a surprise, I couldn't ask her about the uh, choices I was making. Now in Bengali, the third person uh, pronoun doesn't have a gender, it's she, it could be a he or a she, but I had to make a choice in English, obviously. So mm -hmm. I chose she because to me, this poem Acrobat was all, always um, invoked the precarious multitasking that every woman and especially a mother has to go through. And so that's the choice that I made. But when the book came out and she loved it, um, I asked her, I said, Ma, is that did I make the right choice when I chose a she or a he? I mean, what gender had you seen um, as the right one for your protagonist? And she said, actually, I wasn't thinking of gender with this one because to me, this poem was always about the delicate balancing act of a poet. 
because one sentence too long or one word too many could throw you off balance, which was so beautiful and completely made sense to me, but that's absolutely not the way I had read the poem. She loved my translation and she didn't want me to change a word. So that's what ended up being in this book. And when we were uh, deciding on a title in those two weeks um, after we signed the book, that's the title that my mother chose because, oh, because it, it uh, was true to both meanings it, because the book is about the multiple identities of a woman. And at the same time, it's about the delicate poise that you need to achieve as a poet. So I want to know what's your favorite um, memory with your mother, one of the favorite memories, how was the bond like? And also your favorite poem. And I want you to read it in Bangla for us. Well, you know, favorite memories, there's so many that it's, uh, I don't think, I think when you have, we were extremely close um, and we always were, it was, you know, it was not a closeness that developed, like for instance, with my dad, I became a lot closer to him during my college years because I didn't grow up with him. I grew up in an all female family with my mother, my grandmother and my older sister. With my mother, I was, we had a very strong connection. Uh, I mean, as you always do with your mother, but we were, um, we had no secrets from each other. I mean, my mother was the, was the first person that I discussed my first sexual experience with, for instance, you know, so she was, uh, um, she was your mentor. She mentored you. Did you say that? Well, not, not just a mentor. She was kind of my a friend of mine told me something recently, which was, um, interesting because that's not the way you usually see your mother and daughter's relationship. Yes. And she said, you know, I think your mother really was kind of like your true love. I don't think you ever, you ever have given your heart to anybody in the way that you gave to your mother. And I think that's true. Um, so to find one memory, you it's know. It's a tough one, I get that. It would be very, very difficult. I get, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So read us a nice poem in Bangla that you love in this book. One of, one of your, I'm sure you love all of them. Like one of your favorite. Why don't I read your favorite, which okay. is yours? I love uh, in poetry on page 31. Uh, let me read it in Bangla first, actually. So. Jotokal kobitai. Beche thako. Pute thako. Amok passport chobi hoye. Prottek line tumi jege thako. Akonto teshtar moto. Chati pata jantruna amar. Pute thako. Lukiye theko na. Jotokal kobitai machi. In poetry, stay alive, show yourself clearly like an unfailing passport photo. Stay awake in every line, you, like an unquenchable thirst. Yes, you, the pain that tears my heart apart. Show yourself clearly like a flower in full bloom. Don't hide from me as long as I live in poetry. That's so soothing. That's so nice. Thank you. I love it. I want to, I've done half of the book, but the way you've read it, I'm going to try it, read it so slowly. <laughs> absorb it all. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, love. This is so good. It's therapeutic. Exactly. Last bit was therapeutic. I think your uh, relationship with your mom that you said and the way you read the poem, I've connected too many dots here. So thank you so much for your time with me. And I would like to pass on the baton to Siddhi now. I'll hand over to Siddhi. Hi, Nandana. This is Siddhi from Mom Imperfecto. And um, thank you so much for this beautiful book. You read so well. And, you know, uh, when you were sharing your experience, I also felt very emotional. I'm sure it was, you know, a very overwhelming experience for you while translating this book. So my first question to you is that uh, Nabanita Senji was a blessed poet, but she also felt it was an inevitable curse, as mentioned in the book. You know, why, did, why do you think she felt so? In a way, part of it was a joke because she uh, was uh, born to two poets who were very uh, popular and she grew up in this house that was full of poetry and also full of poets because this was the sort of favorite literary haunt of all the poets in Kolkata. So she felt that she couldn't have escaped poetry in any way. It was, it was poetry was predestined for her. But um, she also had a visceral need for poetry. She was her uh, need to write poetry and to make sense of the world through poetry was actually quite compulsive. So she saw it both as a, as a, 
coping mechanism as a freeing mechanism. But at the same time, I think what she meant by that was, and she wrote about this uh, and spoke about it uh, at various points, she felt like she could not hide herself in her poetry at all. So her poetry was her most intimate naked self. Yes. Um, as a woman, as an artist, she could not, there was no part of her that she could hold back in her poetry, which, you know, she was also a hugely popular prose writer. Her narrative nonfiction was so beloved um, and it was loved for its uh, self-deprecation, for its infectious irreverence, for its laugh out loud humor. And she was very honest about the what she saw as the ridiculous uh, parts of her own life, but she distanced it through humor in the, and through cleverness. Whereas mm -hmm. in her poetry, there was no distancing, there was no cleverness. She was at her most raw. Yes. And so she actually even uh, stopped writing poetry for, uh, not writing, she always wrote poetry, she had to write poetry every day, mm -hmm. but she stopped publishing poetry for a while because as she said, she felt it was giving her away. Um, her readers, were getting either concerned about the fact that she was going through a dark phase in her life, which was so clear in her poetry. Mm -hmm. They were also curious about her personal life in a way that she uh, didn't necessarily want to um, share. So, um, so I think it was, she felt that poetry was a compulsion in her and in the same way that sometimes we feel almost as if she was addicted to it. I also noticed that, you know, she was very uh, fond of writing and you know, she wanted to jot down all her thoughts. And like you said, in the raw self that she did it. But, you know, um, readers are not very content with the literary work alone and not just with the poetry. And they always want a glimpse into a woman's life. And that's, you know, that is what you just mentioned. So um, how do you think she handled all that? I think she handled it brilliantly. What she did was um, she she decided that's but that's this is an, a very interesting question to ask right now because that is the point when she realized that that's when she withdrew from her from publishing her poetry never from poetry she never withdrew from poetry but she decided to focus instead on prose and uh, in prose what she did was she just opened mm. her uh, home up she wrote about what was happening in this what seemed to be a dysfunctional broken Fem a broken home. You know, at that time, divorce was very, very rare. In fact, when my mother got divorced, she didn't know anyone else in her circle who had been divorced. And there were all kinds of, you know, things that I would hear about my mother in school, which were completely not true, because of course, the women, the woman is always blamed when a marriage falls apart, even though in this case, you know, the facts were all very clear and it had nothing, you know, it wasn't my mother's decision. But, um, she managed to deal with everything through humor and yet through honesty, uh, which is brilliant. So she wrote about what was happening. When the, when the reader was curious, she said her attitude was, yeah, you want to know more? Okay, come into my house. I'm going to open my door, walk in, take a look. This is the way we live. It's a mess. It's chaotic. Nothing works. And yet everything works beautifully without a man. This is us, right? So that was her attitude. She just took it for, you know, head on. And um, and she did the same with, you know, when we had like, I'd come home in tears saying, you know, this, they said this in school, they said, you know, you were a bad wife or whatever. And uh, she would just laugh. She would just find a way of laughing it off, right? She just never. Uh, and that's such an important quality to have, you know, to be able to laugh at your own self and, you know, take it head on and, you know, willingly, okay, I'll do it, take it in my own spirit. That's so good. Yeah, but you know, the point that you are making, it's actually, it's true, not just for right woman writers, but it's true mm -hmm. for any, any woman who is in the public eye, right? Mm -hmm. So right. it's not just what you're doing uh, in, in terms of your work, whether you're a political leader or whether you are a, a, an actor or a journalist, mm -hmm. it's not just what you are presenting to the world as your work, it's your personal life, it's what you wear, it's, you know, the your shoes, your sari, your hairdo, you know, uh, everybody judges you as a mom, for instance, right? You're all part of a mother, mother's, mother's group, or you're all, and so you, you know that. And there are so many different ways of being a great mother. There's not one way, there's no kind of cookie cutter formula. I, I love the 
the name of your uh, group, uh, Mommy, Mom Imperfecto. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. But um, so that's what I mean. I think as a woman, you are constantly scrutinized and not just scrutinized. Uh, there's a lot of curiosity that you have to deal with if you're a woman in the public eye, no matter what your profession is. Right. Um, so the next one is, you know, as a poet, she was never afraid to uh, cry or laugh or, you know, at her own self. She was very clear in her own outlook towards life. So uh, what similarities, you know, you draw from her own life and how, what similarities do you see in your own character? Well, you know, people, I love to hear this. People often say you are, you just, I mean, my mother, all of my mother's friends and students and sort of uh, mentees uh, often say that I look and sound and seem so much like my mother. So I, uh, that is sort of the biggest compliment that I could ever get. Um, I think uh, genetically there is a lot of not her, not her talent, not her virtuosity, not her brilliance. I think I have what I have inherited from her that I'm most proud of is exactly this. Uh, what you referred to the fact that she was absolutely what you're unselfconscious about her emotions. And I think that is so important. There was an emotional honesty in everything that she wrote, whether it was her prose, whether it was her poetry, whether it was her journalism. She had this weekly column, which was wildly popular. She wrote the last one 10 days before she died from her, from her, uh, she dictated it from her bed. I mean, everything she wrote was, uh, had uh, kind of sparkle with an emotional honesty. And what was unique about her is that the personality that she had as an artist was also true to who she was. So sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with that, you have a writer's persona and that's the way you are in your books. And then there's the person that that you are and there is a separation and maybe that's a healthy separation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's that's the way you work. In my mother's case, that was not the way she was in her work was exactly the way she was in life. So she would laugh, she would cry, she would cuddle us, she would scold us, she would uh, argue publicly, she would rally uh, for social justice. Everything that she did, she committed to emotionally, um, absolutely, you know, 200%. So mm -hmm. she was not, and that's, I think I learned from her uh, the importance of being, really comfortable with your own emotions, being comfortable with expressing them honestly, uh, not in a way that's hurtful to anybody. Of course, it's very important to be honest, but also to be kind. Right. And that's something that I learned from her. But to never feel apologetic or embarrassed by your emotions is something that I've learned from her. That's so beautiful. And now that you speak so well, if you can, you know, um, uh, read a poem. Um, so I like this word. Yeah, so I like this short poem on page number 17. It's called Shame. Why should you be ashamed if spring tells the same lie for years? Why be ashamed of your tears? It's such a beautiful uh, choice you made, Siddhi, in relation to what we were just discussing. Exactly. I, I realize that. <laughs> so um, I really like this poem. In fact, there are a lot of poems. They're so beautiful and I could personally relate to uh, some of them so um, really thank you so much Nandana you speak so well I, I love listening to you and you know talking to you I'll hand over to Upasana now. Hi Nandana Hi. Uh, I'm Upasana from Gurga Moms and as the name says we are a community of moms so I especially love this You're in Gurga I would have had all this support from all of you why oh, am yes. I in New York I'm clearly in the wrong city please visit us once the world settles down <laughs> So, obviously, we love this joint production with your mom. Coming to my questions, Nandana, in mm -hmm. the introduction, you say, you say she believed in the vital necessity of poetry and in every freedom it delivers. Poetry mm -hmm. is a means of our survival. It is a window through which we can breathe. Yeah. Tell me, how do you feel poetry lends to our survival? Well, I think uh, what my mother meant was, and she really believed uh, this was a kind of mantra that was uh, a, a kind of guiding principle or, or a, a faith, I should say, a central faith in her life. She had huge and unshakable faith in the power of poetry as a means to, um, as a tool for freedom for women. And, you know, she saw my grandmother, whose story is really interesting. She was also 
a very uh, popular poet, Radharani Devi. She was married at 12, widowed at 13, remarried when she was almost 30, which was a huge scandal at the time, although widow remarriage had just become uh, legal. Um, and self-educated herself and became a best-selling poet. And um, my mother saw in her life how my grandmother had established herself and created an identity and kind of from the margin uh, of society had brought herself into the center purely through her poetry. Um, but when my mother said that she wasn't just talking about the poetry that's written by women like my mother or my grandmother or me who are privileged and, and educated and brought up in cities, uh, she was also talking about how important it was as a way of uh, creating freedom and as a way of, uh, as a kind of survival tool for um, women in the villages, uh, women who were working on the, on the paddy field. So the songs that they created and sung, which were uh, always inspired by um, the stories of our epic heroines, you know, Sita stories or Draupadi stories. Right. And the way she and my mother called very beautifully uh, this process, singing their sorrows. And I think through singing their sorrows and creating poetry, oral poetry, uh, the kind of strength that these women um, gathered for themselves was also something that my mother did a lot of work on both as a scholar and as a poet and as a kind of you know she she collected uh, these work songs as well and she also always so that's what she meant generally but in her personal life she also often spoke about the fact that she would have disintegrated emotionally if she didn't have poetry in her life so I think in many in all of her upheavals um, all the upheavals that she went through in her life, poetry kind of provided the anchor. And she wrote and said that poetry had, whenever she was drowning, poetry is what had brought her back on shore. And uh, so she felt very strongly that that was, a, um, that was a survival tool for her. And ironically, as I was... Um, Saying at the beginning of our conversation, I realized I was a little too lugubrious perhaps at the start. But, um, you know, when I was translating my mother's poetry at a time when I was kind of lost in my own grief for her, um, I realized for the first time how much pain there was in my mother's words, even though I'd known her poetry all my life. Yeah. I think I, I'd, I'd taken her poetry for granted in the same way that you take your mother your closeness to your mother for granted or indeed your mother tongue for granted right these are all uh parts of your what you grow up with and you think you understand everything about about the this entity whether it's your mother or your mother tongue i mean when you read a poem as a as a reader or even as a daughter it's a different experience from entering the poem as a translator because you own the poem too in your own way absolutely you make absolutely. the poem your own so I, I think in, in choosing and finding the language to voice her pain, I think I found a way of coping with my own grief as well. Uh, you say uh, Ma loved using words that had multiple meanings and resonances, forcing a translator to make some very difficult choices. Mm -hmm. Can you share, I know this is a tough one, but can you share like... Yeah. Sure, I will read a poem. Uh, absolutely, I'll read a poem of her so it's not out of context. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of her most iconic poems and uh, she, was, she always loved reading this one out. And to me, it's about my mother's indomitable spirit, but it's also a poem about the strength of every woman and in this case, every mother. Right, right now, forever. Time has not the power to extinguish me. Don't think for a moment that I wait upon time. Let time keep on playing his absurd battle game. Every time he strips me, I rise clothed without shame. With the force of prayer, of spells magic and divine, all that was untimely will turn auspicious, sublime. In a just war, the rebel stands forever unafraid. For her ally is eternity, who, divinely arrayed, 
guides her chariot, destroying the enemy line. Thus, a divisive age will be defeated and spurned. Though it brings on great wars, it will lose every time. From all our scriptures, this is the truth I have learned. Please know that I am cherished by an undivided infinite age. Time will never have the power to scorch me with its rage. Yeah. To answer your question, the reason why I read this, apart from the fact that I think it's a, it's just um, yes. it's such a wonderful uh, celebration of the innate strength of every woman. Um, there's this word here where, you know, I chose the, it, this, uh, these two lines, this line, thus a divisive age will be defeated and spurned. To answer your question, you know, the fact that she used both words that had multiple meanings and also she created new words. So she uses a word kondokal as one word that doesn't actually exist as a word, kondokal. Right. Okay. Now you can translate it a, a number of different ways. You can translate it as a uh, part of time. Mm -hmm. Kanda is part, right? As a part, Kal is time. So a part of time, you can translate it as part of the time, which is very different in meaning. You can translate it as divided time, or you can translate it as I did, uh, as divisive time. And I chose the term divisive because uh, to me that resonated most with what is happening uh, in our world right now, yes. um, across the world and also in India. And so I think when you translate a poem, you're translating it also, in the context into which you're translating it is also important. Very true. Uh, as long as it's not, you don't want to change anything that's there in the original, but as you're interpreting it, you're also interpreting it at a certain point in time. We keep coming back to the concept of time, but you know, so that moment is time is important in the choice that you make. So I hope that answers your question. It does very well indeed. And I would be delighted if you could read time mm -hmm. from page 28 for us. Shomoy. She should do Shomoy Chaiche. Pach minute. Arkichunoy. Canona she jane. A pach minute ke she onayashe. Ag jibon kore pelte pare. She's only asking for time, five minutes, nothing more. Because she knows she can easily stretch those five minutes into. A lifetime. So Nandana, my question is, time is something so vital and significant to moms. How would you describe time to a mom? I think what motherhood teaches you is that, you know, that time is, um, it's the now, right? Like you're always thinking of the moment. I mean, we should do that in any case. We should be in the moment Anyway, I mean, I'm a big believer in the importance of being in the moment at any time in your life. But as a mother, you can't not be in the moment. You know, where is my daughter's toothache located? Where is, uh, you know, her medicine? What is she up to right now? Why can't I get in touch with her on the phone? Whatever it might be, right? You're always um, deeply entrenched in, in the now. Um, but at the same time, you are also constantly thinking about your child's future in a way that I don't think I ever thought about my future. I mean, I, I always lived in the moment and I lived moment to moment. I just never really had grand plans for the future. I mean, I changed my life around multiple times, kind of without any fear. I don't know. When I think about it, I wonder why I wasn't more scared about making huge choices and, you know, jump leaping between continents and uh, professions and all of that. But, you know, I, I, I lived without uh, worrying about the future, but I don't have that luxury anymore as a child, as a mother. I'm constantly thinking about my uh, daughter's future. And it, as, as simple things like after school, what is she going to do after school, right? How, yeah. how can I keep her busy until uh, and engaged and learning until she goes to bed? So this is, I think you have a different um, understanding of time as a mother as, than you do as a, certainly than I, I did as a, uh, as a single, um, as an individual uh, without a child. Um, in my particular case, I also have to say, and this is unique, in some ways unique to me, I think, since you asked a particular question about 
time and motherhood in uh, as it as I have experienced it, finding a way to give my child a time out. Okay. And and the reason why I'm struggling with it has to do with the past. We have spoken about the future, the present, the importance right. of the now. We have spoken about the future, the plans that we have for our child. In my case, um, because I don't know anything about my child's very early childhood. You know, I'm a very loving, but also quite a firm mother. Uh, and I believe in, you know, I believe in tough love. And as long as there's enough of love that the love is never in question. The reason why it's really hard to enforce a timeout with her, you know, what do you do? Obviously, I would never ask her. Uh, I mean, the only way I would even consider doing a timeout would, would be to remove myself from her, not to remove her from me, but to get to go into my room and close the door and say, OK, this is the timeout. I'm not going to be there for a short while. For five minutes, I'm not going to spend time with you. Right. But that is something that actually makes her really anxious and hysterical. So I am not able to do that because I, the last thing that I want to do, although it's very important for me to find a way of doing a timeout. So I would love any advice that any of you have. What I don't want to do, of course, is to do something that triggers off uh, a traumatic uh, memory that's in her subconscious from her early childhood, right? So of course, I don't want to bring that back, even though I know it's not at the conscious level you know, her conscious memory doesn't have, doesn't include that, but at an subconscious, unconscious level, it must, because she has such a strong reaction to it. That's a long answer to your question. But when you think about time, the past that is not known to me about my own child is something that I'm constantly, uh, you know, confronting as well. It's a very uh, appropriate and valid answer to any mom, I would say, time in this form as well. That was really beautiful, Nandana. Thank you so much. And I'm handing over to Sukirti now. I love the book. I mean, I think some of it gave me a lot of goosebumps because it's also a collection of poetry. It's about womanhood. It's about intimacy. And it's a lot of stuff that I think we can personally identify with. So when you're reading it, you can't read too many at once. You know, so it's not something that you can sit down. So to really enjoy it, I would tell readers, maybe pick up one, pick up two, go to a random page because that really lets you get into the depth of it explore your own feeling. And I love the line that your mom said that with poetry, we get the freedom to explore who we are. How do I know who I am until I have written myself and read myself? It just shows the depth because she has really explored herself. You know, in her writing, she's gone so deep. And I know this has been a dream project for you. So tell us about this because bringing it into English has been, I mean, it can't be easy to do. It was a dream project for me to uh, share with my mother, you know, to kind of give to her because see, my mother made a very um, passionate uh, and political decision, even though she wrote very beautifully in Bengali, in English, to not write in, in English. English. She wanted to write in Bengali to preserve uh, our uh, literary, our language and also our literature. So, and she felt very strongly that all uh, regional writers who wrote in their mother tongues should continue to do that. Uh, she was also a, a language activist in the sense that she was a, a very prolific translator. She translated poetry by women from all over India and all across the world. Um, this, she was very committed to that, however, she was not uh, she was not motivated to translate her own poetry because she would have always rather written, written something new. One. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <love> that. <laughs> exactly, right? So then what happened was, uh, but at the same, she had made that choice knowing very well that that meant that she would, her work, which is absolutely of uh, international, uh, you know, stature and merit and kind of, has a universal brilliance. Um, she knew that, that 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 the cost she was paying for that was preserving her mother tongue and her regional literature, uh, bringing strength to it, but somehow missing out on the world stage. And it's not that that didn't matter to her. She would have loved, of course, as a writer, we want our work to be to be shared by as wide an audience as possible. So she there was a sadness in her always that even though she had, so she was so prolific and, you know, she was 
hugely beloved in every genre she wrote in, right? I mean, right now our conversation makes it seem like she primarily uh, wrote poetry, but actually she saw herself as a poet always. But in fact, she wrote many more books of prose than she wrote of, uh, of poetry. And in every genre she uh, wrote, she was hugely popular, but she hadn't really, her work hadn't been, except for her academic work, which had been um, internationally published and recognized, her creative work hadn't been presented to the, to the world, to an international audience yet. So that was, that was my dream because I also knew that that was her dream. Um, and so, you know, I think you, it just, just like it's true, it's true that uh, parents live their lives and want to live, uh, live their dreams through their children. I think sometimes children want to live their parents' dreams and make those dreams their own. So I think that's how that became a dream project. Was no, was and I'm so glad because also, I mean, we talk about the international audience, but you've also made it accessible to a lot of us that probably could not have read it, you know, in Bangla and in the local language. So thank you for that. But I think one of the questions, and I know this is deeply personal because her poems feel that they're deeply personal. And you already have alluded to this, that it cannot be easy because when you're reading her poems and I'm an outsider and it feels like I'm going through her life and kind of understanding her. And especially because I read your prologue with says she writes how was it for you as a daughter because you already said it's very tough because it's like peeling the layers of the onion and really understanding your mother and as a daughter what was the most difficult part of this and especially the second question because there's so many great poets also in in your house and we've spoken about this in different ways about how close my mother and I were and how much I took that intimacy for granted I loved her so much and she loved me so much it was such unconditional love and uh closeness not that we didn't fight we did we had you know we had certainly had fights too but our fights never lasted very long uh we were always she had taught me to be argumentative and so she had to and I, I feel the same now like I I'm always telling my daughter if you don't agree don't feel like you have to agree if you don't agree make it clear that you don't that that you have a different point of view if you have question you want if you want to question something that somebody is doing then just ask why all of these things that I teach her and then when she comes back and does it with me I'm like why did I have to tell her that you have to are you why can't why can't you just accept the fact that you need to eat your broccoli you know why do I have to give you an exa a reason for every single thing that I want you to do that you don't want to do but of course I don't say that to her because I have taught her that way and similarly my mother had taught me to be argumentative um, and so, you know, she bore the brunt of that a lot of the times because, you know, we had a lot of arguments as well. But going back to this question of intimacy and what happens when you take that intimacy for granted uh, and when you know the poems as well as I did, I uh, was not, I was unprepared, not, I already spoke about how unprepared I was yes. for the, the 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 suffering that I, that the pages revealed to me, uh, you know, because as your your parent always seems to be unbreakable to you, right? You're never really able to step out of your role as a child, no matter how old you are. You, your your parent just the feels invincible, <laughs> invincible to you, right? So even though I knew the poems, just like sensing the depth of her pain was not something I was prepared for. But beyond that. There were also, um, as you said, uh, you know, it it is. It, there is there are so many layers, and it was like it was as if I was reading her journal, because I had known all the poems and I had translated quite a lot of it earlier, but always in bits and bobs. But when I was reading sixty years of poetry together to decide how to do this book, it felt like I was reading. A journal of her life deeply personal, her, deeply, you know yeah. and, and so much of her emotional history many elements of it that had kind of remained mysteries to me while she was alive became clear to me got solved through her poetry after after her death sadly like um i never quite understood why it hadn't worked between my parents you know they were both wonderful people, wonderful friends, uh, wonderful parents, one, you know, wonderful role models. 
and it was her poetry and trying not just reading it but translating her poetry as i said it's a different I level understand. because you're actually looking at every word every meaning you know i mean i think it's that depth of scrutiny that you give it when you're a translator and it's you know it's beyond scrutiny it's like you have to lose yourself in the identity of the poem so you it's just big, you you haven't you're not so the kind of that the the distance that's there when you're reading it or scrutinizing it is not there when you're translating it because you're kind of recreating it right you're 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 imagining and creating that world that pain that confusion again right so you are you are you you are authoring it in a way so it becomes your own so your I mean, I understood that. Uh, I understood my mother was always extremely close to my grandmother, uh, but also had quite a complicated relationship with her. And I understood the complexity of that relationship much better through, uh, there are many poems that she wrote about that relationship that are included in this book. And that uh, I, even though I lived with them, I grew up with them, I loved them both. Um, I didn't really understand fully the intricacy of the relationship they had until I did the translation. So yes, I think it was, I rediscovered uh, my mother's emotional history through the process of translating the poetry. But four poems have already been selected to be in Kitab, which is the best Asian poetry of 2021. What does that feel like? Because, and what are those four poems? Because I was already curious to know. I don't know which four they are actually. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted, but uh, um, I, that's, that's that's really it's wonderful to know and but i'm i'm not actually sure what those four poems are i will read um let Please me read yes, at least yes. one of your yes. favorites so let me read uh since we're talking about motherhood here let me read this child this is the one that gave me goosebumps <laughs> well and it's a little bit connected to what i was talking about earlier so i'll come back to it um this child one day this child too will die this child, pure as milk, whom I've brought into this world with all my heart's desire and with fervent prayer. If she asks me now, on what promise have you thrust me into this strange and dazzling world? What grand celebration must I attend? I will be petrified. Choking with fear, with ignorance, I will run away to a dark cave, numb and empty. What answer will I give you? So, you know, um, this is an extraordinary poem because you don't really have, I mean, there's a lot of poetry about motherhood, but to start a poem with this line, one day this child too will die, is a very, um, not just powerful, but quite a harsh line to start a poem with. And yet it is a thought that I think every mother uh, and the second, about, the second about, thought also is that when this child asked me, why did you bring me into this world? You yes. know, we're also yes. fearful of that because it was your choice. Right, exactly. It was your choice. So I think the other thing, going back to what we were talking about, about the process of translation and discovery and rediscovery, um, I really, again, because I had always seen my mother as uh, unbreakable, I had never understood the level of anxiety she felt as a mother until I translated her poetry. And uh, this is an, a great example of that. And I think throughout the book, there are poems that talk about uh, the joy of motherhood, but also um, the responsibility of bringing a life into this broken world. Uh, and and also with my mother, she was a... Um, you know, she was my mother, but she was also in some ways like a child, my, like my child, until I became a mother and had a literal child. You know, she was the one who was sort of who I loved to dote on and pamper and, and, every, and protect in every way. She was the person that I pampered and protected. And, and there was a side to my mother that was very childlike, that, she, that never grew up. She, she, and that was one of the, the great... Uh, and it shows in some of her poetry because there is that tongue in cheek in there too sometimes. Yes, and that's right. And then she was really fun loving too, which came out like a child. There was a childlike joy 
uh, uh, of life and a childlike curiosity about everything in the world. That's one of the reasons why she loved traveling all over the world. Um, and so there was a part of her that never quite grew up and some of the poetry that she has here, including there's a, another beautiful poem, which at this time I'll read called The Great Fair, which is, which talks about this, her surprise at, some, at realizing that she sort of stayed a child, but somehow the world has grown up around her. Suddenly her limbs have become long, but how has that, how is that possible, right? So there was that part, there was that eternal child in her. And um, so the, the, the poetry, this, you know, there was, I think the reason why I, I mean, I don't know if it was the fact that I hadn't been able to step out of my role as a daughter where I just saw her as the strongest person I knew, or the fact that I hadn't yet become a mother, that I hadn't fully understood the anxiety about motherhood that she felt that I then grasped much better through her poetry. And I think it's actually remarkable, you know, as this is again, um, interesting for us to, uh, to, to, to recognize as since we're all talking about motherhood and we're mother, we're groups that focus on the experience of motherhood. You know, she wrote at a time when um, you were not allowed to talk about the anxiety of motherhood. That was seen yeah. as being a bad mother. Now it's opened up much more. We can talk about it in, in, in many different ways. There are more outlets, there's social media, there's a language for it. At the time when she wrote, at the time when she wrote about her own uncertainty about and her uh, fear, her fears as a mother uh, and her worry that she may not be a perfect mother, all of those things. And then also the, the, the uh, challenges of being a mother, right? Like you were not allowed to talk about motherhood as a challenge because that somehow made you less good of a mother. That's the way it was seen at that time, right? No, but what I think is fantastic in her poetry is I don't know if it's fantastic, but even today, when we are sitting here in 2022, we can still relate to those words. Yeah. Those words yeah. still hit us and they say they are so apropos even now. So I think, you know, it's like something that we will say that maybe as mothers, as women, she has captured that emotion that maybe is deep within us because it is something that is like, I'll go back to your first thing, that is beyond time. <laughs> so it is something that is living across time because these emotions are something that are binding us together and your poetry has brought it out beautifully. And you wrote a letter to your mother at the end of the, the book. Tell us about that and please do read from that. And I definitely want you to read that other poem also. Okay, absolutely. The uh, one that's called um, Too Much, yeah? Yes. Okay. I really, did I ask for too much? That one again, I think I resonated with quite, quite much. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. It's actually a diptych, there are two poems and um, the two love poems. And I think that's the, the um, um, I mean, her love poems are really beautiful and really kind of complex because, uh, and at the same time, very universal. And, and these, these two poems, Too Much and Out of Reach, uh, talk about questions that I think um, not quite- I think not we questions, all go through that in a relationship, exactly. you know. Yeah, and, and we are always asking ourselves these questions. And then the second one that um, is, a, is a kind of companion piece to too much is about the fact that they're in love, there is always war. You, th that part of loving is actually fighting. And that is, it, and it's, it's sort of beautiful because um, I was reading somewhere, there's this great, I'm digressing here, but it was fascinating to, read about this is this, this longitudinal study that was done at Harvard University in the um, uh, health uh, in the uh, in the school of um, in the medical school where they were looking at what and a friend of mine Bob Waldinger has done this stu study of happiness and what what are the couples who have over 60 years uh, been the most happy and there were a few things that you were not that we were not expecting they the most. <laughs> that showed up that was one of the things the, they were able the, to fight you know the, the couples who fought the most and argued the most were much happier than the than the couples who never argued and it was just kind of fascinating to no, it kind of makes so sense but I would have, because i think the people that are not fighting they're probably holding it in so that is yeah. that unkept emotion that just kind of erupts yeah and i also read at these two both these poems i think 
are love poems, but they're also poems that we ask, they're, they're also their thoughts that we ask ourselves as, as parents as well. And there, there's conflict that there is, you know, there's a kind of conflict that you have as a parent and as a child where uh, part of the love uh, and the part of the way you express your love is also war. You know, so that they actually, to me, they are, they are love poems, but they're also poems about uh, negotiating, navigating motherhood. Mm -hmm. Too much. Did I ask for too much then? I wanted just two eyes, nothing more. No dawn, no dusk, no long night, not food, nor clothes, nor shelter. Neither remembrance nor reflection, but a moment's attention to be erased in the next moment. That's all. Still, did I ask for too much? This one is out of reach. You asked for a nameless love out of reach. I weaved you a wreath of blooms each to each. You want love's tempered breeze softly sighing. I blow you a dark thunderstorm, terrifying. Your love is detached afar, chased to its core. My love is in part love and in part war. Very beautifully, you read it so, I mean, it's like <laughs> really hits you. But I want you to also read, if you can for us, a little bit of that letter that you wrote to your mom. You know, this, there's a, there is a history behind this letter. Um, so I, I wrote, I started writing this letter on my mother's 75th birthday and uh, I kept adding to it um, throughout the years. Um, I completed it only after she passed away. Was she able to read even part yes, of it? She, she had read most of it because okay. it had been published, uh, you know, on Mother's Day, you know, version of it had been published and it, it was, you know, so she knew the poem, uh, she knew the, she really loved the letter and whenever we did any event, uh, poetry event together, she always wanted me to read the poem, so uh, read the, read the letter. So, it's, uh, I'm really touched that you've asked me to. No, it's to, very fitting also for us to have that as our last reading for today also. Thank you. I won't read the whole poem, but I'll, I'll uh, the whole um, letter, but I'll read you a, an excerpt um, from it. A letter to Ma. It is true I was created in you. It is also true that you were created for me. Maya Angelou. My first semester in college, you arrived in between your conferences suitcases and admirers in tow, refusing abundant offers of hospitality in Cambridge, you shared and immediately redecorated the one and a half rooms assigned to my two roommates and me. Every morning, you stood in line in our noisy dormitory to claim your three minutes in the shower. You preferred the modern steel and glass shower stalls opposite our room to the quieter, more old fashioned bathroom down the hall. You left after a week, just as I was getting used to finding your hip length hair in my comb and turning every head in the 1000 strong Harvard Union where you swept into dinner with me, gliding in like a queen, like you always did. A few weeks later, we hit midterm exams. I overslept the first day, found the showers occupied and sprinted to the other bathroom in panic. As I stumbled onto freezing tiles and fiddled with the cranky knob that spurted cold water for red and boiling for blue, something miraculously familiar caught my eye. A crimson dot of velvet on the narrow gray wall. Your well-traveled bindi, carefully transported from your forehead and placed beyond reach of the spray. In a flash, I could hear your laugh and smell your scent. I could feel the tension in my neck melt into the mist surrounding me. That perfect circle of red gave evidence on the mildewed wall that you would always be there, far away, so close. Although there were unending demands on your time, a few years ago, you had somehow managed to find several days for us to translate together my bedtime book for children, not yet. Um, the book is a playful dialogue and rhyme between a mother and a child. A naughty little girl finds countless excuses not to go to bed, while her ever patient mother is determined to put her to sleep. The literal Bengali translation of not yet is Akonina, but you had laughed your own little girl laugh and declared, no, the girl must be much more emphatic. She will say 
Ekunina, Ekunina. Well, this obstinate daughter of yours kept saying to her mother in the last few weeks, Ekunina, Ekunina. Could you hear me, Ma? Not too long ago, I pulled a big blue book from our Kolkata shelf, 365 Bedtime Stories. When I opened it, out fell a red gold rush of leaves, oaks, maples, and ferns collected in London when I was a toddler. We had gathered them together in the woods at the bottom of the hill where we lived. One night, as you were reading to me about Tinkerbell, I interrupted you with a technical question. What are fairy wings made of? Butterfly wings, bird feathers, or huge petals? There are all kinds of fairies, you see, you replied, just as there are all kinds of people. Do all fairies look like you? I persisted. I don't think so, you smiled. Fairies are very, very beautiful. But Ma, I protested, you're the most beautiful person in the world. You laughed much more raucously than Tinker Bell would as you drew heavy curtains over tall windows. Every little girl believes that about their mother, to push. Well, Ma, I've grown up a bit. My world has grown up a lot. I left home as a child and made beautiful friends who became my family. In my work, I've met many beautiful faces, walked with beautiful figures. I've fallen in love with beautiful minds. You grew up too. More books published, many awards won. A few more clashes with your stubbornly loving daughters. Around your eyes, a few more lines celebrating years of full-throated life. More world tours, many with me, when you swept me away with your infectious appetite for discovery, your limitless sense of wonder. Remember that list we made some years ago of unvisited countries that you absolutely had to explore? Wheelchair in tow, we made it to most entries on that list, including China, Egypt, and South Africa, but not Burma. Each time we traveled, you transformed our adventures into provocative essays or best-selling books. And on every trip, we shared even more pleasures together than our plentiful arguments. Yes, we did have fights. I cried when you didn't understand. I begged you not to nag. I yelled at you when I was upset with someone else. I watched in panic as tears welled up in your ever adolescent eyes. But I'm as sure today as I was that night in London that even if you had not been my mother, even if that most precious accident of birth had by rights been the beginning of someone else's story, even if I had met you in any of your other roles as a poet, professor, painter, friend, or a stranger on a plane, you would still be the most beautiful person I could ever have met. At the end of Not Yet, the daughter asks, Ma, did you turn out the light? And the mother replies, yes, my dear. Now, good night. So touching and I think the only word we can say is Akonina. I hope I pronounced it correctly because this has been so heartwarming, so touching. I don't want that not yet to end, but so thankful for you and so grateful to have had this time with you. So back to her Preet, but really, really touching. I am still soaking it in. I was hearing, I was... Okay, this was very insightful, love. It was very insightful, very deep, very touching. You've touched, I don't know how much and what all in my heart, I can't tell you. I was thinking, you know, uh, so we might be whoever. For us, a mother is a mother. And, you know, for that mother, the child is a child. Thank you. <clears throat> you spoke so well. So, yes, I'm sure everyone in the audience enjoyed this session as much as I did and all of us did. And I want to thank Siddhi, Upasna and Sukriti for joining us and asking such beautiful questions that you actually made her cry. <laughs> And guys, don't forget that this wonderful book, Acrobat, is published by Juggernaut and is available at all leading bookstores. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. A heartwarming bye-bye to all of you.